Okay, we are recording. I am joined today by Aaron Meskin, uh, who is a professor of philosophy and head of the philosophy department at the University of Georgia uh, in Athens, Georgia, which is the home of Indie Rock. Um, so thanks so much for joining me today, Aaron. Thanks for, thanks for inviting me, Brandon. I'm looking forward to it. Awesome. So we're going to talk about your paper, Mere Exposure to Bad Art, uh, which you co-wrote with Mark Phelan, Margaret Moore, and Matthew Kieran. Uh, and it's in the British Journal of Aesthetics from 2013. Um, and could you go in just to begin, uh, what's motivating the paper? Like, what's the worry that led you to come up with this experiment that you describe and, and discuss in the paper? Okay. So there's this well-established phenomenon called the mere exposure effect, which is mere unreinforced exposure to a stimulus is enough to enhance positive feeling, positive affect towards it. So that's, that's well-established, been, been around for uh, since the beginning of experimental psychology. People have talked about that. Um, uh, a really interesting psychologist at Cornell University, James Cutting, um, started exploring the relationship between the mere exposure effect and judgments about art. So uh, in, he did a series of studies where he, he explored whether and to what extent mere exposure affected people's judgments. He first um, so picked a, a sample of famous impressionist works and then some matched works and then looked at which were the most reproduced and then tested people to see which ones they liked the most and found that people liked the ones that were most reproduced. Now that doesn't tell you that much because maybe the reproduced ones are the good ones or something. But he then, he went on to take those pairs and differentially expose students in an introductory class to those paintings. So he would do it in the middle of the class without talking about it, about the paintings, just expose them to those paintings. And he was able to show that mere exposure, just being exposed briefly to these paintings over the course of a semester was enough to um, switch, switch students' attitudes towards the painting so that they no longer preferred the, the ones that historically were more reproduced. That is to say, exposure in class changed which ones they preferred, which ones they liked. So that's, you know, that's interesting, really cool study. And, and I, I can't recommend the original uh, cutting study um, enough. It's um, Gustave Calabot, French Impressionism and Mere Exposure, Psychonomic Bulletin, 2003. Really fun paper. And I, I may have butchered the pronunciation there of the artist. Um, right, so, so what is that? Why is that interesting for philosophers? I don't think, and I don't think my authors think on its own, it presents a devastating objection to the idea that artistic value is real and objective. But it's the kind of result that someone skeptical about aesthetic value and aesthetic judgment would appeal to. And let me just give you two different ways of thinking about why a skeptic about artistic value, that is to say, someone who's skeptical about whether artistic value is real, objective, independent of us, um, might be how they might use Cutting's results. So one, one uh, way to think about it is that most arguments for aesthetic value realism, aesthetic objectivity, um, they, the arguments run by inference to the best explanation. The idea is that something like works past the test of time that we, we continue to care about and find great value in Shakespeare, and Beethoven, they, they pass the test of time and test of space because there's something in them, something valuable that people across time and space uh, recognize. Similarly, 
we might, and related to test of time, we might say the best explanation of canon formation, the fact that we sort of come to recognize that certain things are central and important in a particular art form, that has to do with recognizing that they have value. So the argument is a kind of inference to the best explanation. And one thing you might think about Cutting's results is that there's an there's the suggestion that there might be another explanation or at least another mechanism at play in canon formation or in works passing the test of time. Rather than people recognizing their value, um, critics recognize their value across time, maybe it's the fact that certain works just get shown a lot or played a lot, which makes people like them and makes them pass the test of time. So, so one way of seeing the, the relevance of Cutting's results is that it undercuts a traditional argument, kind of style of argument for aesthetic realism, aesthetic objectivity, by suggesting there's another kind of explanation for why, why canons form, why works pass the test of time. That was a, I know that was a long-winded answer. I wanted to just give one other way of thinking about the Cutting result slightly different gloss on it from the skeptical view. I mean, the other the other way to think about it is that if cutting's right, then our aesthetic judgments and our artistic judgments are sensitive to factors that we're often not aware of and that don't seem to be essentially connected to the work. So we just sort of find out by result if, you know, if Cutting's right, that our judgments are not tracking, don't seem to be tracking the uh, objective features of the work, of works as much, but are rather influenced by these features that we're not aware of, like how many times we've seen them before. And that, although again, that doesn't lead to sort of all things considered skepticism right, right away, it can start sort of pushing you in a kind of skeptical direction thinking, hey, you know, my judgments aren't, you know, they're not rooted in something that's really central, important to the artwork. They're, they're all these irrelevant factors are affecting them. So that's, that's why we found the cutting essay interesting. Um, I'll stop there for a second. Okay, great. And so, you know, what you all did for your paper is set up an experiment where instead of exposing students to works of art that are considered good in general, right? Mm -hmm. that, that cuttings looking at, you know, pieces of um, impressionist painting that have been reproduced a lot and works that are still good, considered wide, you know, widely considered good, that are, you know, by the same sorts of artists, but just haven't for whatever reason been reproduced as much. Right. And so what you all did was expose students not to, you know, works of art, all of which are considered good, but some works uh, that are considered good and also some that are considered bad. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So. So our thought was, um, hey, look, all the works that Cutting used in his study are by, you know, pretty, pretty great artists and exposing them to students, to people made sorry, exposing them to students made the students like them more. And he appeals to mere exposure. But here's an alternate hypothesis. Maybe, uh, maybe those are those great works, when you get exposed to them a few times, you come, you come to be better able to see what's good about them. Like listening to a Radiohead album a few times and once you get to the third or fourth time, you think, oh, now I'm, I sort of understand what's going on or so, something like that, or a Young Thug album. Um, so we thought, hey, wouldn't it be cool to see, to kind of test that, I, that thought by exposing students to bad works of art? And then, and if, if our hunch was right or our hypothesis was right that it was the goodness that was playing a role and, and people coming to sort of students coming to see recognize the, the goodness in those works at, through multiple exposures, then maybe the exposure effect wouldn't happen or would be more attenuated or something if we had bad works of art. 
So then we had, so that was like our idea. And then we had, as you can imagine, um, a fun and challenging and entertaining time trying to figure out what were gonna be the bad works of art. So we needed for our study, some stuff that we could plausibly say was bad art. And that was, um, that was a, lot of the, a lot of the challenge in design and fun in the design was trying to think of how to come up with that. And so the bad works of art you came up with or that you landed on were by Thomas Kincaid, the painter of light. <laughs> Yeah, so, um, I mean, I, I, we thought about a lot of different things, but we ended up using paintings by one artist, the popular American artist, Thomas Kincaid, um, who you've, you know, people have seen his reproductions of his works in books and I think in malls, I think that's, they're often malls and hotels. And, um, there were a few reasons why we chose those. I mean, um, one, we thought they were really bad. We agreed. The three estheticians who sort of started planning the study, we all agreed that they were pretty, pretty terrible works of art. Uh, two, we could find lots of critical support for our judgments. That is to say, there are lots of reviewers and art critics who say these Thomas Kincaid paintings are really bad. Uh, Three, there are a lot of them, so we had a lot of stimuli to use, and they're easily accessible on the internet. Um, so there's availability. Um, for, I mean, you know, it was kind of, um, I think we liked the, there was an aesthetic to, to our choice too. I think it was sort of interesting and fun to choose the Kincaids. So, but, um, Mostly, we agreed that they were bad. We had critical support for their, for our judgments, and they were readily available. Um, so that's why we went with that. Obviously, lots of people have questioned that. And you know, how can you say the Kincaids are bad? Yeah, and so how can you say that the Kincaids are bad? Right? How <laughs> confident should we be in that judgment? Because, you know, lots of people like his work. Well, I mean, that lots of people like something, Brandon, as you know, does not make it good. I mean, we, you know, lots of people liked MC Hammer and Vanilla Ice back in the day. Lots of people like, liked Fifty Shades of Grey. Um, uh, so, you know, mere popularity, I think, doesn't... Um, God, lots of people liked the song My Humps. I mean, it's a mystery, but I mean, many people did. Um, or, or James Blunt. I mean, think of how popular James Blunt was back in the day. Um, so I think mere popularity uh, doesn't, you know, that certainly doesn't entail that this stuff is good. We, we recognize that lots of the times people, um, uh, people make mistakes. Uh, even large groups of people make mistakes. Many of us make mistakes. Um, I guess I don't have a general theory of why people like what's bad, although there are lots of things one can say. There are lots of factors, right? There's social pressure. There's lack of, um, lack of delicacy of taste, as you might say. There's failure to know much about the relevant form, art form or genre. Um, there's lack of experience um, or lack of time spent with the particular work. Um, there's the appeal, there's sort of easy appeals, things that are sort of pleasant um, and easily accessible that aren't always necessarily linked with uh, quality. So that, I guess that responds to part of your question. The fact that they're so popular um, doesn't, I think, doesn't tell so much against our claim that they're bad. I mean, I do think if you look at art criticism, the experts, um, and I'm enough of a human to think that the, we, you know, we ought to defer to the, in some sense, to the experts, um, 
in particular with respect to particular forms and genres they're pretty um they seem to agree pretty strongly that Kincaid is um saccharine and cliche um it's not so much the technique that people complain about with with Kincaid with art critics it's the content the yeah the cliche and saccharine overly sweet um sentimental content of the works predictable content of the work that that art critics mostly point to so i think insofar as you're attracted by the humean thought that there are true judges or at least people who are experts in particular domains um i think you'll be attracted to the idea that kincaid kincaid's works are not that good honestly what i usually tell people is to just go look at some of the kincaids online and i mean most people most people that i you know that i, I engage with, when i say go look at these kincaids you know they, they they're fairly willing to admit that they're pretty pretty bad paintings um, yeah right and i mean as you mentioned his paintings were ubiquitous right and in a sense still are right in shopping malls and hotels at least that aesthetic right yeah. the sort of pastel um uh yeah saccharine etc and you know he sort of fostered that right that you know you can buy reproductions of his paintings on canvases that someone in a studio right he died in 2012 i think right um but you know someone in a studio sort of you know there's reproduction someone in the studio adds a bit to it and you can have a painting in your home a reproduction of a thomas kincaid authenticated from his studio touched by someone who works in his studio for 1200 bucks right um you know you can't do that <laughs> with you know anyone who's in tape britain uh and, and so forth right um i don't know I mean, it is worth noting, I guess I don't want to push this too much, but the fact that many that people buy something does not certainly it does not follow that they like that thing. I mean, as we all know, right, we all we all sometimes regret our purchases. Um, so I don't want to push that too much. But um, I mean, what we do know is that Kincaid is like bought a lot. Um, but um, I mean, there are certain fast food sandwiches that are bought a lot too, Brandon, and I, you know, I just don't think they're very good. Yeah, I mean, I, it's weird for me to be put in the position of defending Thomas Kincaid, and I don't know how much further I want to do it because you know, I think you're right that he is sort of like the the McDonald's of <laughs> fine the fine art world, right? Maybe the Arby's. <laughs> it could well be the Arby's of uh, painting. Yeah. Um, so what did you all find with your experiment? Right, and then we can talk about that. Well, so I was just gonna tell you a little bit how we did the experiment, because it was really fun. Oh yeah, I had go for a, it. I had a, a third year I remember correctly, it was a philosophy of literature class. And um, we just kind of wanted to copy the, the cuttings idea of just like showing the um, paintings in class, but without any comment. And, you know, I wasn't going to say, and now we're going to look at some paintings by these guys. So we had to figure out some, some, some way of doing it. And we also wanted them like timed, uh, you know, so they would like be flashed on the screen for like a, a second or two each. Um, so what we did was we made up these little PowerPoint presentation inserts that had like 12 slides. And in the middle of my lecture, I would always like, like, I think on the first day of the semester, I was like, it's very important. It's been shown that it's very important for, for learning to have a break in the middle of a lecture. And so we're always going to have an intermission and just, we're, we're, you know, we'll, at that time, you know, I won't lecture and we'll just probably look at some images or listen to something or whatever. So um, we just had an intermission in every lecture and at the intermission I would, would pop in this like 12 or 13 slide uh, little PowerPoint with timed time slides. 
Um, and I would like try to, I would like say nothing and try not to look at the students, you know, just kind of look away or whatever. So that's what we did. We basically, we had these Kincaid paintings and we had some paintings that were, we thought roughly similar in terms of content and palette, broadly landscape paintings by the, by the painter Millet that were, had been recently, there'd been a show of them and they had been a, a pretty well acclaimed. Um, so we were counting those as good paintings. And then we just differentially exposed the students to the painting. So half the Kincaids they saw multiple times during the semester, half of them they saw once, half of the Malays they saw multiple times, half of them they saw once. And then um, uh, we had some control groups too, um, some classes who didn't see them. And then at the end, we just showed them all the paintings um, on the last day of class or whatever, we show all the paintings and ask them to evaluate them. And what we found both, we found that any exposure at all decreased liking for the Kincaids. So if you compare the experimental group who were exposed either one time or five times to the Kincaids um, with the control group, uh, they liked the they liked all the Kincaids last. So any amount of expo exposure uh, decreased liking, and um, when you compare it within the experimental group, their attitudes towards the Kincaids that seen once or they had seen multiple times, they're like the ones they see multiple times less also. So just being exposed to Kincaids at all seemed to reduce liking for them, and being exposed a bunch of times to the Kincaid seemed to reduce liking for them even more. So that was cool. We found this kind of um, decreased liking on the basis of mere exposure to bad art or so, or so we, or so we hypothesize in the paper. Yeah, right. And so this, the skeptic, you know, they were sort of going off the idea that, look, mere exposure increases liking across the board, right? And so our, our tastes and, you know, what, counts as, or what becomes canonical and so forth, the things that have passed the test of time, uh, mere exposure plays a role in that. What, what you all showed is that, or it seemed to show is that maybe that's not the case, right? Because, you know, if you're looking at the experiments by cutting and others, you know, they're looking at good art, right? Whereas if you expose people to bad art, they like it less over, the time, over time. And so mere exposure, um, doesn't give you the, the skeptic the results they need in order to, you know, help confirm their views about canonicity or about say, uh, passing the test of time and so forth. Yeah, so, so it looks like if, you know, if our results are right, it looks like something else is at play in the response to the Kincaids other than mere exposure, because mere exposure increases your positive at attitude um, towards, uh, towards stimuli. And we found this decrease. Now, something else looks to be in play, and that undercuts a bit the challenge from the cutting-based skeptic. Cutting himself slides back and forth in, in his attitude. Sometimes he sounds quite skeptical, sometimes he doesn't. Um, I think his official view is he's not skeptical. Um, but uh, certainly other people have appealed to results like this and been skeptical. And we, so our results, which show that something else is going on. Um, now, we haven't established that it's, I mean, one thing to say is we haven't certainly established without doubt that it's the badness of the Kincaids that's doing the work. Um, that's our hypothesis. I mean, that was what we, that was our hypothesis going in. We thought the badness of the Kincaids would make a difference to exposure, and we got support for that. But of course, someone might say there's some other feature of the Kincaids uh, that um, that is driving this. Um, so that's possible. It would be lovely to get some further studies done around this to explore this some more. Um, I've heard from. I had heard that some people were looking at this, but I haven't seen anyone trying to replicate or extend the results in the last, in the last few years. But yeah, so 
we suggest something else is going on in this exposure to the Kincaids. We think it might be badness. Um, uh, whatever it is, it looks like it presents a bit of a challenge to the cutting base skeptic because they're not, they can't appeal just to, uh, just to mere exposure to explain these changes in judgments. Yeah, awesome. And so, you know, I feel like this sort of relates to, you know, exposure to things that are difficult initially, right? I mean, the, the paintings that you were looking at, both the Kincaids and the Malays, right? They're not necessarily challenging or difficult works, right? Malays is clearly a, a better painter. Um, the works are more sophisticated and nuanced, but, you know, like I'm thinking of things like, you know, getting into scotch or getting into wine or getting into coffee, right? And initially there are hurdles to overcome, you know, if your palate's not used to things that are that bitter or that smoky or that, you know, have that level of complexity, right? You're initially disinclined. And yet if you push through, right? And especially you have someone to sort of help you and guide you and give you a vocabulary to sort of latch on to the flavors you're detecting. Um, you know, you're able to get better and better at detecting the, the good making features, right? And so that seems to be, you know, a sip here, a sip there. And then eventually over time, you come to, to like this initially off-putting thing. Um, whereas Kincaid, I think, you know, what you showed is that initially students liked it. Right, they like the Kincaid more than the Malay painting. Yeah. Right, and it's because it's easier, <laughs> right? And yet, the more they are exposed to the the Kincaid, the less they liked it because it was too simple, right? Perhaps, or it just too bad, right? That's, I mean, that is a really nice way of putting it. I love the food analogy. You know, I'm I'm interested in in, in the philosophy of food. Certainly, um, one has that experience with food a dosa, for example, a masala dosa, one might have one or two bites of it, not like it initially, and might need like five bites in order to recognize how good it is. Um, perhaps more, uh, yeah, um, more commonly, I mean, I, I think there's some some very good coffee, for example, when, or, or tea that you have, um, where again, you're, you're absolutely right, the first sip, first sip you might not reckon you might you might not have what you're looking for maybe you're used to starbucks kind of roasting and so you're looking for that dark almost smoky roast or what have you um and then it and but it after five or six sips or after trying it a few different days uh you finally recognize the sort of subtle sweetness and fruit flavors in the coffee that you weren't getting from the other uh, from the from the dark roast, um, that's right. I just wanted to say with scotch, I I really do. I still struggle with scotch, the smokiness. It's just it's a little much for me. Yeah, gotcha. Just um, sharing. Yeah, and I had at least eight bites of that dose. <laughs> <laughs> um, so just just one question. Some people might be skeptical that what you're doing is philosophy, right? That you're you're have hypotheses, you're coming up with experiments, you're running experiments, what you're doing is more like psychology, right, than philosophy. How would you respond to someone who's worried that this really isn't philosophy, right? Philosophers can rely on um, or make use of exper experimental evidence from other fields, but why are philosophers doing it themselves? Yeah. So, I mean, there's so many things to say about this. I mean, in one sense, I'm just not that worried. I mean, like one of the good things about having like tenure in academia is like you can like study what you want and, um, and you know, if you want to go get involved in an empirical study, uh, you can. Um, so I'm like not that bothered if someone told me, hey, what you were doing there was psychology. I guess it doesn't bother me. And in fact, I've, I have done some work with psych, I did some work in the philosophy of food uh, with some psychologists at the University of Leeds and that published in a psychology journal. So I'm fine with like doing psychology, that doesn't bother me. Um, it's like a bonus actually, right? You can, you can do different things. I, a few other thoughts that just come to mind. I'm, one is like we, we 
call ourselves, well, I do, I think you do, estheticians. And uh, sometimes we say philosophical estheticians, but actually a lot of the time we just say estheticians. And I think there is a way in which aesthetics um, is a bit broader than, is broader than philosophical aesthetics. So there are people people in musicology and literature, literary studies who do aesthetics. I think it's plausible there are people doing neuroscience who do aesthetics. So one thing I would say, and maybe this is linked to that not being so bothered that I was, if I was doing psychology is, I'm really interested in aesthetics and it doesn't, um, and aesthetics is broader than philosophical aesthetics. And so if what I do sometimes, um, uh, goes over into the, the non-philosophical, that would be fine with me. I, I have two more thoughts. I'm coming on this. I mean, I, I guess one thought is, I mean, I, I think philosophy is so heterogeneous. It's, you know, it's a real, it's a cluster, cluster concept. It's not another kind of cluster. It's a cluster concept. Maybe philosophy, cluster concept, or... Um, I mean, there are just lots of different ways of doing philosophy, and I guess I'm just a kind of a pluralist about doing philosophy. I think, you know, in that paper, there's lots of philosophical argument in it. In it. We're engaging with philosoph philosophical thoughts. We're thinking about the relevance of empirical studies for, for philosophical thoughts and philosophical ideas. So in some sense, I think it just is philosophy. Maybe it's a kind of non-standard kind, but it's, it's a kind. And the final thought I, I'm gonna on this is um, so. So I've written on hybrid art forms. I've written on comic books as a as a hybrid art form, which comes from like two different art forms intersecting, coming together. So I think comics sort of literature meets the visual arts in a certain sort of way, and you get you get comics. Um, there are other sorts of hybrid art forms. Jerry Levinson is best known for writing about hybrid art forms. Um, uh, concrete poetry is an, a nice example of a, of a hybrid art form. Maybe experimental aesthetics is like a hybrid, like a, hy a hybrid discipline, like psychology and cognitive science meet philosophy. Um, that's kind of cool. I, I, I'd be happy with that too. So. I guess that's like three different answers, but um, so I don't, I don't have a settled view on that. I'm not, I don't worry about it too much. Well, I'm glad you have tenure <laughs> and that you've had tenure for a while. <laughs> thanks, Brandon. <laughs> awesome. Well, Aaron, thanks so much for joining me. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Brandon. It was fun. Yep.